Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to our third web series on advanced manufacturing in tribal nations. My name is Patrick Freeland and I'll be helping to facilitate this meeting. But first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Catt, who has been uh, managing this project to tell us a little bit more about where it's come from and where it's going. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity that uh, the National Science Foundation has funded for us. Uh, we started out a number of years ago with stakeholder meetings, inviting people from a variety of different places, uh, primarily within tribal lands and tribal colleges, but also those who support them, uh, those who have the potential to support them, um, and those who uh, are, are generating resources and research that are progressing with advanced manufacturing and the technologies that are involved with that. Through that, we examine a number of things. And no, one of the things, there's two primary uh, items that, that came to, to mind as we went through this, is that number one, um, tribal nations, tribal communities have the potential to take advantage of these new technologies, uh, primarily because uh, they don't have legacies in these technologies, uh, personnel, equipment, facilities, those kind of things that they can progress into these new technologies if they, if they see that and, and can take advantage of it. So that's what these are, are all about, uh, that we sense potential. Uh, we wanna talk about this potential and we wanna make sure these, um, the tribal nations have the access to uh, the resources that can uh, help with this. And so we, again, we thank the uh, National Science Foundation. We also thank the, um, AHEC, um, American Indian Higher Ed Consortium, uh, that represent around 37, what we call TCUs, tribal colleges and universities. Um, and so without uh, those agencies helping us uh, coordinate these, these fascinating conversations, um, none of this would be possible. So we thank, thank these organizations for doing that. And we also thank all of the TCU uh, faculty, administrative, uh, and staff and um, the students especially uh, for their enthusiasm in progressing this. There's a lot of good things happening throughout this, this network of colleges that uh, we wanna uh, share, and but we also want to enhance. So uh, it is really cool to uh, have everyone together. I see one of my colleagues uh, from Western Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm located north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just so you know where I'm located. Uh, and um, I have a background in uh, community college administration, workforce development, advanced manufacturing. Uh, and so those are the kind of things we bring to the table here. And I see one of my colleagues, Byron, it's nice to see you. Uh, he's also in Western Pennsylvania. So uh, a couple of us over here with cl cloudy skies today. So thank you. All right, Maru, thank you. <clears throat> So, if you'll bear with me a moment. Nice to see you too, Steve. So today, we're going to talk about paths forward and potential resources. In the chat, I posted a link to our first two webinars. In our first webinar, we asked, what is advanced manufacturing? Where we learned how a range of workforce from industrial designers to technicians were needed. In our second webinar, we took a virtual tour of an advanced manufacturing operation and learned how critical partnerships from the advanced manufacturing sector and educational institutions are to be successful. And today, we're going to talk with some experts and leaders to illuminate the pathways <clears throat> from ideation to operation, and especially to share out about resources, funding opportunities, and partnerships to leapfrog tribal communities into advanced manufacturing that centers tribal sovereignty and provides economic opportunities for tribal people, partners, and allies. Partnerships matter. In our first, uh, in first two webinars, we really understood that these sorts of 
successful operations don't happen alone, nor do they happen within a singular institution. Education is best at times um, when it happens through hands-on work, when, when workforce uh, is, is created through practical experiences. And so from our first two questions that asked what is advanced manufacturing and also what works, we learned two very important things. And the first, oops, uh, oh wait, there it is. First is that advanced manufacturing can work for, tri for tribal communities in Indian country by providing educational opportunities, economic growth, and supporting nat native peoples that enhances tribal cultures and advancing self-determination. And of course, the partnerships matter. And there are many who are ready to support advanced manufacturing in tribal communities. So what is most required then must be relationship building, establishing trust, building consent for partnerships, and making sure to keep the conversation going. So today, we will discuss pathways forward and potential resources with some great leaders and experts. So again, <clears throat> it's my honor to introduce Dr. Stephen Kapp, who's not only been leading this work to provide meetings and webinars in advanced manufacturing, but who has been a staunch advocate for advancing opportunities with tribal partners. Stephen, the floor is yours. Turn your audio on, Stephen. I am. All I have to do is do that. Yep. Very good. So anyhow, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you for the introduction, Patrick. Um, what's interesting about this is that there's so many things happening right now that it makes it a lot, um, makes it very difficult and challenging for us to keep up with everything. Let me just share my screen for just a second. And I want to... Um, share one slide with you that I think is appropriate. This slide shows, you know, not only the growth of world population, but the history of technology um, and, and the technology that, you know, the agricultural revolution, pottery, uh, the rest of it that, that started uh, eons ago with many of our ancestors all doing the same thing. And then all of a sudden in these in our within our lifetimes, uh, the acceleration of technological revolutions and transformations uh, is not only mind boggling, but it is accelerating. And so when you there's a Chinese proverb that says, may you live in interesting times, um, that can be a blessing or a curse. And so we're seeing an entire society, all of our societies are reacting to these uh, in, in a variety of different ways. And those who are uh, making sure that, or, or part of the ed cutting edge of those technologies are pushing forward, but we're also seeing as um, Alvin Toffler in the 1970s wrote a book called Future Shock, uh, talking about the backlash uh, of those new technologies and how the acceleration of change can really have a backlash to it as well. Uh, and so we want to make sure that the changes that are occurring uh, are uh, moldable and amenable to our own cultures and to our own thought process. And so they become comfortable within us so that we can start um, acknowledging them and using them in productive ways. And part of the conversations we've been having, I'll stop this now, part of the conversations we've been having is uh, how, how to accomplish these new technologies, these new thought processes and, and new ways of doing things and embed that Unlike in, as I shared with you, I live in uh, north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, that was in the midst of the Rust Belt uh, that um, in the 1970s, 1980s, our, our entire uh, um, economies were in the midst of collapsing. Um, and so we lo lost population, we lost industries, the steel industry especially was hit hard all of the industries were hit hard during that time. And so now what we're, we have for decades after that, we have legacies of people 
uh, and the way they did things and the way they were used to doing things. We had legacies of facilities, large facilities that were now empty and we needed to find and retool them. We had tons of equipment that were dated uh, for pre previous industries and those kind of things. So we had huge legacies that were kind of weighing our, our environments down in this particular environment. Well, one of the things we identified in, in, in Indian country, if you will, is that they don't have those legacies. And so there is an opportunity to leapfrog into these new technologies because they don't have the legacies of previous experience with these particular industries. They don't have the legacies of the huge facilities and those kind of things. And they don't have the legacies of uh, outdated e equipment and, and how to use those. The, the additive manufacturing, Bob Graff, I know is gonna be talking about this quite a bit as far as the uh, new technologies that are, are becoming available and are available now, we've talked about them. But what's interesting is that now we have the opportunity to, uh, especially in, in areas in rural, remote areas that didn't have the opportunities to, to take place, to take part of the uh, production pipelines in the past, now you don't need to be near an, a large urban center. Now you don't need to be near a large water source or other resources to do big industry. You can start these high quality additive manufacturing and a number of other different industries uh, in these, these regions, as long as you have electricity, access to the internet, and a FedEx truck um, uh, that, that does deliveries every once in a while, you can really get into these high quality uh, high, uh, high quantity, if you will, uh, kinds of things. So there's a lot of great opportunities that we can, can do with this. The, the, one of the, the other aspect that we've found out through the stakeholder meetings is the need, and, and, and I'm so thankful Patrick is helping to moderate this because he infuses, you know, what being a Native American is all about. Um, I share, you know, my story. I don't have that background, but Patrick and others that we have met certainly do. And I, well, I can't tell you how much I respect and learn every day about this, these, these new cultures. There's over 500 separate um, new sovereign, not new. Um, there's over 500 sovereign tribes throughout the United States, each of them with their own culture, each of them with many of their own languages, and need to be protected. And so a lot of the efforts going on right now is regaining and retaining those languages and cultures and those kind of things. Along with that need, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an honorable and great need to, to protect those cultures, uh, these new technologies can provide new career pathways and new revenue streams for the very communities so that their young people and the best talents that they have don't have to go elsewhere and lose their community, lose their, 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 their culture, and they can remain where they are with these uh, potential new technologies and those kind of things. So the, one of the, many of the things that we're talking about is how do we use this new advanced manufacturing through micro factories, through other technologies to become part of that, that, that pipeline or the, the pathways now, uh, the workforce pipeline uh, to be able to be part of all of that. So it's, uh, it's an interesting time to be uh, part of this. We sense a lot of potential and um, hope that, uh, that the resources that we can bring together, not only today, but throughout this whole process, will help start enhancing everything that the, the good work that is being done uh, to this point. So at this point, I'd like to introduce John Phillips. He's the interim president of, of AHEC, uh, but also he's uh, been a, a project manager for land grant opportunities and grants uh, for AHEC for the last number of years and brings a wealth of experience uh, working with this particular organization and 
has an intimate knowledge of the TCUs and and how they work. So, um, John, welcome to the to the to the webinar. Yeah, thanks, Steve, and uh, thanks uh, for uh, inviting me. And hi, everyone. Um, I also enjoy uh, listening to Steve talk um, about uh, the programs and and his vision and opportunities that uh, the tribal colleges have. Just as a little bit of background, um, I'm in an interim role as president and CEO of AHEC. Uh, my, my normal job is uh, I manage the environmental uh, portfolio at AHEC, which includes uh, USDA funded land grant programs and some other agency funded programs uh, around climate work, um, natural resource management, environmental systems, those sorts of things. And my academic background, I got my undergrad um, in computer science as a software engineer, and then my master's in environmental engineering, and then uh, my doctorate's in rural sociology. So I ended up in the community development space. So, so from a personal standpoint, I see the connection of applying technology um, and workforce development in, in the pursuit of community development. So I really see all of this kind of focusing in on how do we make tribal nations more prosperous and, um, and build uh, tribal uh, nation sovereignty um, through education and through the work that we're doing. So let me, um, let me share my screen here if I can do that. And what I wanted to do, can you all see that? Let's see if I get this. There we go. Um, I wanted to start our conversation off this afternoon or this morning with just some baseline information of what the tribal colleges are, and then talk a little bit about what opportunities I see for partnering, for uh, assisting the tribal college in building their capacity to do things um, better and to support our students. And I thought that might be, uh, Steve and I were talking, that might be a good setup for some of our other panelists, and then a further discussion around partnerships, because Patrick's right, we can't do this alone. Um, it takes it takes partners and allies to get the work done these days, um, sharing resources and following mutual interests. So um, um, that's that's hopefully where we can get this conversation to today. So I know some of you are from tribal colleges, so this is going to be familiar information, but I want a common understanding and grounding before we get going. So for those of you that are maybe new to the tribal colleges, you might find this helpful. Um, we start, I'll, ta I'll talk about what are the tribal colleges and universities, and then a little bit about what AHEC does. Um, so we have 37 institutions across 17 states. Most of them are rural-based, reservation-based um, institutions. They often serve as the anchor institution in these reservation communities and economies. So they can be the largest employer. They might have the largest impact in terms of, of spending in the community. They're producing jobs, but they're also filling jobs. Um, so in the community development world, when we talk about anchor institutions, these are really um, kingpins in the in the local economy. Um, our, if you said, what are the three things that define tribal colleges? I would say we're student focused first and foremost. We provide open access to both native and non-native students in the area. And um, we're community-based and culturally grounded. So if you walk the halls of a tribal college campus, you're gonna see artwork and pictures and cultural artifacts that really surround our students and faculty in this idea of cultural identity. And the numbers fluctuate, especially coming out of COVID, but and roughly about 28,000 full or part-time students annually attend our TCUs. That number is, is rising um, rapidly um, as we have moved to a lot of distance programs, uh, especially coming out of COVID. Here's just another map um, so you get a better idea of where we are. You'll see most of our colleges are up in the north central upper midwestern region um, with a cluster in the in the southwest um, and in the Great Lakes region. And um, we have a, a, a few in the sort of the Pacific Northwest area. 
So I mentioned that our, our uh, colleges are really student-driven, and that is absolute, absolutely true. All of our colleges started off as teaching institutions, um, supporting students in getting the degrees they need and the training and skills they need to get jobs. And um, so, you know, most of our students have been not what we call non-traditional students. Um, our average age at, at one point was middle 30s. Um, that number is coming down as we get more first um, sort of more traditional students coming right out of high school. But in large part, most of these students are first generation students. This is the first time any of them, any of their families has been in college. Um, low income, come from low income communities. College readiness is a challenge for us. You know, by the time they come out of high school and into our doors, a lot of times they're, they're, we find that they're back level in some of the core skills, math, reading, um, and so forth. So um, we have to do some college prep work with them to get them up to speed. And then, as I mentioned, there's a growing demand for distance education, um, not just um, to, to connect with our students, but we also see our faculty wanting that as well. A little bit about our faculty, um, as, I, as I mentioned, because we're primarily teaching institutions, our faculty are treated um, pretty much like um, you would see high school teachers a lot on 10 month, nine month contracts. We do not have tenure at institutions. Our typical course load is six a semester. Um, so if, you're, if you uh, operate in, in higher education, we call that a 6-6, six, six, so that's both semesters, six courses. That's a pretty massive teaching load for, um, what, for what most people would consider. Um, there is no research appointments per se. So if they do research, if they do any other um, additional work, that's an add-on to their teaching responsibilities. So a lot of times our teachers are working over the summers, late at night on weekends to, to make it all work. And you'll see in that chart, most of our, our teachers, our faculty are at the master's level in terms of their credentialing. Um, all our co colleges offer two-year degree programs. You know, we're moving more and more into four-year degree programs. So maybe I'd say half offer four-year, um, but even when they offer four-year, it might just be in one particular program. So like um, elementary education might be a four-year program, but the rest of the um, degree programs are two year. And then we have, um, we're offering more, uh, a few more master's degree programs at our colleges too. So we do do research. Um, it's typically very applied with short term um, um, projects and with what we say is tangible results. So this is often driven by a specific tribal need. So um, we're not you know, we don't have the luxury to work on 20 year longitudinal studies. This is something that has to be impactful um, with tangible results to the tribe. Um, so th it requires, and we have a relatively low institutional investment in terms of time and money into research. We like to involve our undergraduate students in the work. This is a win-win. Um, it gets them experience and builds their skills. Um, and it also helps out our faculty get the work done since we don't have doctoral students to rely on, um, which is, is what happens at most mainstream institutions. And as I mentioned, high priority given to community impact, much lower priority to publishing or grant success. Those aren't typically metrics that um, our faculty uh, need to, to be successful. And then I like to point out that we do a good job of, in, of blending indigenous knowledge and complementing that with Western science. So um, um, our, we bring indigenous knowledge through our faculty, through our students, through our community advisors, our elders, um, and we infuse that into everything we do, teaching and, and research. So um, that's a quick, uh, sort of a scan of tribal colleges. I wanted to talk about some of the ways that we work towards building human capacity. So as I walk through these um, bullet points, think about you know, where you, you're sitting at, you know, how, if you were to engage with tribal colleges, how might you help us build our capacity um, to do the work? So um, 
visiting faculty or fellows from mainstream universities, federal agencies, partners, other partners is really important. We are, we have more classes that we want to offer and not enough faculty to teach them. So um, the pool of available faculty in a remote reservation community is quite small. Um, some of that we can solve with distance um, um, education, but we're really um, looking for, for teaching faculty that can help us. So um, the, other, the other way that we're working on building capacity is co-locating offices and staff and, and using joint appointments. So for example, one of our colleges in Wisconsin is, um, is co-located with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Extension Program. So we have um, College of Monomination and Wisconsin um, staff working together in the same space, working on similar programs. And that's just a great idea for building our capacity. <laughs> Tapping into doc students or postdocs, having them work at tribal colleges is a great learning experience for them and it helps build our capacity. Um, federally supported internships, fellowships, um, work details, those sorts of things both bring expertise to campuses, but also takes our expertise and shares it with other agencies or other partners um, um, in DC or wherever they may be. We talk a lot about faculty to faculty sharing and mentoring. Um, it doesn't have to be a faculty on the other person's side. It could be a, a, a scientist or some expert in the field, but just the, the collaboration and the cross-pollination of, of uh, faculty with outside experts is helpful for us. And then, and then sharing technical assistance and training and professional development opportunities wherever possible. So in your circles, if you come across a neat training or opportunity or fellowship, share that with your, your tribal college colleague or partner. Um, they might benefit from those as well. And then on the program side, you know, think about the win-win collaborative endeavors that build capacity. Never, never do you want to drain capacity from a tribal college. So um, if you're asking something of a tribal college, you know, what is the value add that is returning to them that makes their, that makes, gives them a return on investment? So if it's going to, if there is a cost to a tribal college, what's the return on investment that's going to make it worthwhile? There's got to be a net value add to that relationship or else it is, it's going to drain capacity from a tribal college. Um, leverage and exist and share existing capacity to pursue more opportunities. So think about, this is sort of a strength-based approach. Think about what the tribal college is doing well, where its assets and strengths lie, and let's build on that and, and leverage that for, for more capacity. Um, whatever you do, help build this program staff and infrastructure. Um, so especially when you're looking at budgets, um, think about how you can add resources and capacity to tribal colleges. Um, some of these opportunities require a match requirement. We often can't provide that match. So think about helping us, whether it's in-kind support or however, to, to come up with those matches. <laughs> and I'll tell people, avoid mac micro dollars for macro level projects. So sure, the budgets are always squeezed, but if they're squeezed, don't squeeze the tribal college side of that budget. And sometimes, I mean, the best answer is just to say, not now. Um, you know, look for the opportunity that makes sense. Um, and if it doesn't make sense at the particular time, um, it's okay to hit the pause button and regroup for the next one. All right, um, I just, to wrap up, I wanted to talk about some of the, the priorities that we have at AHEC from where I'm sitting. Um, we are really interested in workforce development. There are a lot of, you know, with the economy in, in the way it is, there's a lot of jobs out there. Um, there's a lot of technologies being developed um, in the climate space, renewable energy space. There's a lot of what we call green jobs coming up. Um, and we need to get our students ready for those opportunities. So um, that's that's a priority, not just for us, for but for, for a lot of the, the federal agencies that we work with. 
Um, STEM fields, I don't need to tell this group that that is an important area of growth um, in the economy and at um, our colleges in terms of our academic programs, in terms of our research, in terms of our students' interests. They see this as areas that they want to move into. Um, I mentioned the institutional and faculty capacity development. We're always trying to make our institutions stronger and be able to stand on their own. And, and we can only do that by helping them build their capacity. Um, we're also interested in place-based community economic development. As I mentioned at, at the beginning, our tribal colleges sit within a reservation community and economy, and they are anchors and pillars to that, and they are economic engines that can drive innovation in their communities. So we want them to add that value to their communities. So whatever we can do to support that is important. And then lastly, and this probably pivots to our, our conversation this afternoon, is we see strategic partners as a way to do all of that. Um, we can't do it without you all. Um, our tribal colleges can't do it without us, all of us working together. And so we are open ears um, to ideas, to opportunities, to partners that can help us move together in, in building um, up our tribal colleges. So with that, um, Steve, Patrick, I will um, stop for now. Um, I think we'll take questions later, yeah? Or, um, yeah, I'll just turn it back over to you. Thank you. Very good. Patrick is in and out today, I think. Uh, he, he said he's having some neighborhood uh, electrical <laughs> it challenges, so uh, he'll, he'll be back with us. Uh, thank you so much, John. This is really good. And I like what, you know, everything you said was good uh, and uh, resonates with what we are trying to do. Um, and it shows how progressive AHEC is in uh, acting as an umbrella organization, supporting all the TCUs in a variety of different environments. So it, it really is an interesting uh, setup that you have uh, and the challenges you have as well. So uh, we appreciate uh, everything you guys are doing and everything that uh, you expressed. One of the things that I've noticed is, and you've alluded to it, and one of the things our stakeholder meetings identified was the fact that you know, it's, I hate to use the chicken and egg uh, analogy, but sometimes uh, these, the technical, the uh, the colleges, the tribal colleges, and universities uh, can create these wonderful programs and have dedicated faculty, and they have graduates in these technologies and engineering and those kind of things. But if the jobs are not within that tribal uh, environment, then there's an economic development problem or challenge with that. And, um, and so this is a larger problem or, or a larger challenge, I won't say problem, but a larger challenge than just being able to create a new program. It's making sure that there's jobs available so that you don't lose the talent that you've created. And they, the, the choices are that uh, these graduates either have to move away from their own communities that they don't want to move away from, or they stay in their communities and their education is not utilized. And so you have a, a, a system of underemployment at that point. So, and I know a lot of share, communities share that same kind of thing, um, but from a tribal perspective, when you're trying to protect the culture as well, and your life, lo, life blood is, is so important to you from the elders onto the youth that are being um, developed, uh, it is even a, a more important challenge. So uh, again, John, thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, move our discussion to Bob Graff, a good friend of mine. Uh, we met uh, whenever I was with the ARM Institute, Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing, uh, as part of the education and workforce development team. Uh, we brought together a number of people, uh, resources to, to be able to help us uh, guide these new policies and understand the technologies that were behind the, the cutting edge. Bob was one of the, the premier people that we invited to the team. He has experience and job life with Apple 
and then he moved to Yaskawa Robotics. In both cases, he developed curriculum and training and all kinds of materials to, to translate these technologies, whatever they were, to people who needed to know it, whether they were incumbent employees or newly trained people coming into the, the fold or, or just learning about the new Yaskawa uh, robotics, being able to do that. One of the reasons why I invited Bob and wanted him to be part of today is to talk about the cutting edge and uh, technologies that are out there and just give us a, uh, an up-to-date uh, viewpoint of it, but also you know, from the perspective of industry. And so we have a lot of faculty and a lot, a lot of uh, good um, people who are on the front lines doing the curriculum development and that kind of stuff from an academic standpoint. Bob brings that added layer because he not only works within the academic programs and with them, but also brings this, this attitude from uh, the, 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 the kinds of things from industry that are hands-on cutting edge right now what needs to happen sometimes they don't match and so bob will talk a little bit more about that and so bob welcome to the team welcome to this webinar and we really appreciate uh, your time today thank you steve um john that that last slide with the priorities is is spot on that's the world i live in every, every day um so um thanks for kind of giving me that the intro, Steve, I'm going to just jump in and um, share my screen here. What Steve asked me to do really was um, perspective and kind of where the rubber meets the road. Um, I've, I probably could spend hours doing this, talking about it, but uh, we don't have that time. <laughs> So I'm gonna really focus in, I think where the rubber meets the road and also what I would call maybe the beginning of a playbook for developing a manufacturing based initiative uh, in, in the workforce arena to help build the economic growth that uh, the tribal nations need and also to focus on this next generation. Um, so having said all that, um, I'm just going to bring these all up and just kind of work through them. It's important that as you're looking at these different partnerships and potentially collaborations, what are those technology trends that are going on, you know, kind of at the world level and at the technology level, but also how that's going to affect the different kind of career pathways that your students and potential people that are looking for jobs of uh, what they are gonna need. And, and it's really based around the sector and we'll talk more about it. I think another really important thing to look at is building consensus locally, regionally, federally by raising awareness and marketing through offerings that the tribal nations um, can support. So whether it's certifications, credentialing, training, opportunities to maybe apprenticeships. Um, all these are different ways that can bring awareness. So I would strongly recommend as you're thinking about, as you're expanding is how to expand your marketing efforts. The other piece that the number three is really important as well. And that is looking at local and regional manufacturing opportunities within the sectors that the tribal nations represent, where there's opportunities to partner, to, to make new products, to build new pathways, or maybe uh, pipelines to hire more people. All this affects the work and learn experiences. So aligning those programs that you develop to the manufacturing is one way. The other way is manufacturers that are coming to you who are asking for your help to develop these programs so that they can do a better job of building their products or innovation. Um, the fourth piece that I think is really critical is um, offering not just relevant certifications, but certifications that 
are really in line with what's going on with these technology trends where it makes sense and where it's affordable in terms of funding and being able to, to put trainers in place and instructors. But, but really what you're doing is you're helping to develop the next generation of employable skills um, through this training. So these students that you're going to be bringing in who are looking at getting hired in these positions, um, they have the right certifications. It's relevant and that they can keep growing their experience and training as they move through their career. Um, and then the last thing, which is, you know, going back to this list that Steve had talked about, they have priorities, engage your partners wherever it's possible, wherever you have the opportunity. And it's at all sorts of different levels. It could be at the technology level. It could be at the uh, the career opportunity level. It could be maybe partnering on a joint project to develop or innovate some technology or part um, that might have a huge impact on the community or the area. And that's all done through this tr the training and different uh, platforms that you can help to develop. Um, and this is usually the slide that everybody looks at me like I'm crazy, but I would call this your ecosystem. This is not everything that goes into building a, a workforce partnership. On the left, you have more of the education um, opportunity at the very highest level, the departments at the federal or the state level, the tribal college, um, AHEC, for example, could be part of that. As you move across, what you're really trying to do is build workforce, transforming it, and then leveraging the federal um, organizations and different um, companies and certification groups that invest in the workforce. So that could be Manufacturing USA. It could be, um, obviously, the Department of Labor, Commerce, NSF, NIST. I, uh, a whole list of different agencies. In the middle here really is how that flow works. So what you're trying to do is build sector partnerships on the left here by providing certified training. These are the four things you're gonna need to help build that by building the, the relationships, partnerships, and then working yourself through these different organizations. Um, and having done this forever, it's a process. Uh, it requires really people to get together and to look at the mission and goal of the projects that you're developing to see how you could tap into these resources. And really at the bottom, it's kind of this ongoing idea of providing the most relevant current um, training through different curriculum, different certifications, pro providing the best kinds of training instructors and programs. Um, and that's really an ongoing thing. It's, a, it's assessing what the needs are of these sector partnerships and manufacturers, looking how you can attract and recruit. And then of course, at the heart of it is training and development and then retaining um, those people. One of the things we do know in workforce, especially in manufacturing, is a lot of people that are involved in manufacturing and automation that may be looking at retiring are actually moving back into education to, tr to teach. Then the other thing is happening, which is a lot of people who are have been teachers or have experience in manufacturing through colleges and through programs are leaving the university and actually joining manufacturers as trainers. So there's a lot of synergy that goes on because the needs are so great. Um, th this is uh, interesting trends. I get tons of email about this. If you look it up, um, automation, industry 4.0, technology, you know, every kind of trend that's going on right now, the, the really it's um, the growth 
of AI and machine learning, that is the biggie. That's huge. I'll talk more about that in a minute. AI is going to be used in just about every um, kind of workforce need in, uh, on the on the training side, on the technology side, and being able to understand how to use it effectively and how to use it as a tool is going to be very important, especially as we move forward for decision making, things like predictive maintenance and predictive analysis to be more efficient. And it goes right in hand with the internet, the internet of things. If, if you're familiar with that term, it's really connecting all the different devices together. And because AI is gonna, is gonna be more increasingly important, how you connect those devices to build widgets or to monitor them between systems is gonna be more important. Um, and because that's more important, cybersecurity is going to continually be a top priority and a trend to make sure that um, if you're providing training like that, that there's uh, probably the most effective tools to use as we move forward for using cybersecurity um, to protect data and to protect against threats and so on. Um, AR, VR, augmented reality and virtual reality are going to continue to be um, used much more in much more unique ways in manufacturing and in the automation industry um, because uh, it's beca it's not just the training thing where you're using a simulation. It might be actually using a, a product technology to fix let's say um, a smart factory at three in the morning and you're the maintenance person and need to go in and actually look at um, through virtual reality or augmented reality, what is going on with a system that's broken. All these things kind of roll up together. So training and implementation for AR and VR are gonna continue to be huge. The other big one that I think will uh, affect the, the the tribes, I think for the sector relationships and partnerships is looking at different technologies in, in robotics um, to use effectively. Collaborative robotics is a fairly newer technology and it's really the ability to work uh, side by side, hand in hand with a robot to um, build a process, build a product, um, what I believe is happening here, especially in um, smaller industries that are much more customized and that might fit more in the sector type partnerships that the, the tribes may be using in the different regions is smaller batches of products, a more focused effort to build products so collaborative robots are gonna be much more um, able to do that. So I would be looking at some of those type of technologies. And then the big one that's going on across, actually the world globally is the use of autonomous vehicles and drones, which are really an extension of robotics. Um, but these are gonna be used and you're seeing them every day. Um, it will be used a lot more for um, not just delivery, but for monitoring um, and also for um, performance and to actually deliver, not just deliver, but to actually effectively um, use the technology to, um, with AI and the Internet of Things to monitor uh, effectiveness. So for example, um, if it's a, um, well, let's just think of like a drone product, you might be using it as part of a landscaping and using robots as part of that. <laughs> the drones could be used for mapping and logistics to develop. A, so I can go into those pretty deep. These six trends really make up um, probably the heart of where things are going. 
with technology. The other one that Steve mentioned is additive, which is 3D printing. And um, that really rolls up into building, designing, and expansion of different devices to provide a much more efficient way to um, build things quicker, design new innovations and so on. So looking at all these trends, I, I want to take a minute to talk about the opportunities. I'm just picking really out of all these different ones. AI is probably the most profound impact. Um, I don't know how many of you've used AI. If you've used, let's say, chat, GPT a little bit. But what we're really talking about here, artificial intelligence, um, is really, you know, learning, teaching, instructing with curriculum that is aligned to a manufacturing, how to enhance automation capability. Quicker, better, faster, more efficient. AI is being used for those things right now. Um, I'm seeing a lot of AI being developed um, in the area of um, data management. Perception and sensing is how your manufacturing is used with devices to pick and place widgets and different things as you're building, um, let's say it's an assembly line. So the AI computer vision that we're referring to right here really is a very intelligent form of a camera or a sensing device that knows the ability to perceive what that widget might be and interact with it in the environment. AI is going is making that much easier to do, which means it's more efficient, more effective. Um, robotics, I know we keep going back to that, but robotics is definitely here to stay. AI and robotics go hand in hand. And as I see over the last two years, there's an, a huge movement um, to make robots easier to use, less programming, uh, dependent, uh, much more intelligent because of AI. So decision-making process and problem solving is really only the tip of the iceberg for robotics with AI. But it really, it's the beginning of like a whole new way of using robots um, that can intelligently design systems on their own, technically. Um, the collaborative robotic is a subset of that, and that's going to help improve safety, efficiency with people that are working hand in hand with a robot in an environment uh, where they need very precise things done. Uh, AI can will, can and will take over and be able to help people do a better, more efficient job. The other one that they don't talk about a whole lot, but I think is real important is predictive maintenance. Everything breaks. So <laughs> depending on how long it takes for it to break, but predictive maintenance really with AI provides engineers, people that are monitoring these systems uh, for training or for production to understand if there's going to be any issues. Um, this has been a huge problem with big manufacturing facilities like car and automotive, for example. If a, if a line goes down and it's down for eight, eight hours, for example, um, did they have the tools to predict that it was going to go down or was it smart enough? This AI is going to help to uh, make that much easier. So when we talk about all these technologies rolling up, this is a nice picture of like a perfect smart factory. What I'm gonna recommend is for any of the colleges and, and regardless of where they're located or what their needs are, if they're serving the manufacturing communities and they're training and they're really involved in the day-to-day -day, um, of what's going on, they don't need to spend a whole lot of money 
or invest in a lot of technology sophistication to be able to, to manufacture. What they really need is, is the help of the sector partnership. Whoever those manufacturers that they have relationships can pretty much work with the college to develop what that smart factory may look like. So when we're talking about, it, it may include um, robots, it might be 3D printers, it might be vision systems. Um, there's always an element of safety and risk assessment involved when you're building these. Because there's such a huge growth right now, and because of the adoption of these technologies, I think that's where your future is going to be, is building systems or classrooms that could serve for training, but also could serve, uh, let's say, a manufacturer to actually build a new product or to innovate or experiment with. That's going to drive the growth. So it, it's kind of like a, a, a kind of a loopy thing. It's here to stay. The trends that are happening now are all built into the system here. So as there's more demands and more diversity in what's being built out there, new innovations and technologies, this would be a recommendation for sure. So as we look at the opportunities that are available for you. Uh, I put this little thing up here first. This is kind of like, this is the life cycle of how do you optimize your workforce programs? It is a circular, uh, never ending process. Um, so as I was saying, this is kind of like a playbook. So if I were to recommend these, um, let's say five or six things, the first thing I would, would, would say to all of you is to look at what I call the, the asset map. Who are your partners? What is your technology you own? What are the manufacturers and what they do? Um, look at the economics of it. Look at the populations and the demographics. All this builds up so that you have a profile of what you can offer in your area in terms of um, training certification and being help to improve the economy grow. The second thing is that as you're developing your technology plan, don't be too concerned about the funding, be more concerned about what your partners need. The funding should follow and, and fall in place once you develop the right plan and the right training and certification. You also need to really look at who your trainers are or who your educators are that can provide this kind of training for certification. Um, they, you know, I it doesn't maybe matter as much as their real world experience, it's important, but it's really how well they do in the classroom how well they can make things relevant in context to what they're training on. I've seen uh, some of the smartest people get in there in the classroom and they just can't teach it because it's too elevated in what they're trying to do. When we're talking about qualified trainers and technicians, mentors, you want a really good cross selection and section of who represents your area, your sector, your geographic and demographic and the partners, which leads to the other one, which is um, your oversight and management team, your advisory team, your committees. Um, having been on lots of them, I think the success of those um, manufacturing oversight teams really is to have a short-term plan and a long-term plan with benchmarks and milestones that can be checked off and measured. And whatever that measurement might be, maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year, or maybe it's during the funding source, maybe it's a three-year funded thing. Whatever it might be, what you're really looking at is trying to provide a world-class uh, um, program that touches on growth using industry technology 
uh, and implementing it so it's the best representation of what your training could be. And that's, that's usually like a two hour presentation. <laughs> any, uh, Steve, any, any questions, thoughts? No, that, that's all good. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and, and what I like about your presentation and what your perspective brings is that, that it, this is, this is an interactive uh, process that takes industry, educators, and all the stakeholders to come together to create the, 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 the proper training in that particular region. And one of the things you know, we were talking about is that the training, uh, the regions that we talk about, sometimes, especially when you're talking about remote areas, that region needs to be expanded. You need to be very creative in how large and what kind of resources you can bring that, you know, with remote work now, remote learning, remote work and that kind of stuff, you can expand your, your regions yeah. almost infinitely uh, at this point uh, in our, in our lives. So uh, that's, what's one of the things that, that I like about thinking through the, these creative solutions that we could come up with now. Right. And, you know, as, as I've seen it, um, I think the key to all this is having a playbook or some group within your committee or advisory sitting down and saying, okay, these are our, you know, priorities. This is how it breaks out with the time frames. And if you could stick with really the best quality that you can and the most relevant things, bring in the right people. And of course, with the right funding, um, it's all going to fall in place. I think the most important thing right now is to really do a deep dive. If, if, if it was me doing this, I would do a deep dive and look at each of these regions, like that map, and really think through who could be our partners, who mm -hmm. the potential manufacturing sectors that we may be able to serve. And, and it should fall in place. Thanks, Bob. What? Patrick? Patrick, your sound is all wrong for some reason. No, not yet. Okay, I'll, Patrick, I'll, I'll take it from there, thanks. Uh, so anyhow, our next speaker is Jen. Um, and Jen, say, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jen's coming in a little bit last minute. Her colleague had, had an illness, and so she's coming in from the Department of Labor, ETA. Uh, and, and Jen Smith is uh, uh, going to help us out understanding another aspect of resources and funding that many tribal colleges, uh, you know, have not taken advantage of is the way that, that I think they could. So Jen, welcome to our team. Welcome to this webinar. We're looking forward to hearing what kind of resources you bring to the table. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm glad I was able to step in. Um, I can't replace Robin, but I will do my best. Um, and I, I do have the slides that she had. So uh, I will apologize in advance if I'm looking at my notes a bit more than uh, perhaps I would otherwise. Um, but, you know, but at the same time, this is certainly, um, I agree with what you just said um, about this being an area that tribal colleges could probably tap into more. Um, and we're really trying to do a lot of outreach and awareness raising. So there's a lot of, you know, great intersectionality here. And so I'm very happy to be on and talk about this. I'll also point out that I know some of my colleagues from DOL are on as well. Um, and I'll shout them out briefly uh, in, a, in a minute. I did want to really quickly just say, uh, and I know that Bob said this as well, um, that I, I just, I loved hearing the um, AIHEC priorities from John because Every single one of them aligns with absolutely what we're trying to do as well. Um, you know, workforce development obviously is our bread and butter, um, but you know, focus on STEM activities, capacity uh, building and development, which I'll talk about a little later, specifically with some opportunities, place-based economic development, and the strategic partnerships. Um, I'm, I'm going to dive deeply into strategic partnerships and pretty much everything I talk about because that's obviously a huge part of what we think is necessary for an effective public workforce model and for effective workforce um, development. 
So um, I will really quickly, hopefully this works, um, share my slides. Um, let me know if this doesn't work. Okay. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yep. Looks so, good, Jen. Thanks. Wonderful. So as I mentioned, um, I'm excited to be here to talk with you all about the public workforce system that we uh, we support, um, and in particular, how that system can help to support you all in developing some advanced manufacturing training pathways. And it's especially true in light of the almost $2 trillion in uh, recent investments as part of the Investing in America agenda. Um, so I'll start with a brief summary of the public workforce development system, not being sure how much everybody on the call uh, knows about that. You know, I'll talk about how it's structured and managed and funded and um, talk about some potential areas where you can partner through the system. And then I'll also focus on some of our very specific competitive grant funding programs that may be of, um, of interest to you all, as well as um, highlighting some of the resources available. Um, and as I mentioned before, I, I saw that I think Stephanie West, um, Kayla Hilario, and Kavehi um, Brandau from our Division of Indian and Native American Programs are also on this call, so happy to have them with me and their expertise. Um, let's make sure my slide movement works. Nope. Yeah. There we go. Um, okay, so the public workforce system is designed to address the specific needs of two primary customers, job seekers and businesses. And everything we do stems from those two aspects, right? So first it helps job seekers find access, uh, find and access workforce training, education, and other resources such as supportive services. Um, that's a big part of what we're focused on right now to help them to be able to enter into, return to, or retain employment. And in particular, we're really focused on doing that in, in good quality jobs. Um, and advanced manufacturing generally is an area that's had a, a has a lot of qual job quality overall. So um, so it's a great area that we're focusing a lot on. Um, second, we partner with businesses to match them to or help them retain their existing workforce and make sure that they have the skilled workers that they need to be able to better compete in this global economy. Um, we work with businesses in a lot of emerging sectors um, and uh, advanced manufacturing is a huge area for us. Um, particularly, we have a lot of focus right now on semiconductor manufacturing um, uh, given the Chips and Science Act investment recently. Um, so how do we do all this? Uh, we have a very specific structure and flow. Um, and so I think it's helpful to understand how the workforce system works, to understand places where you might be able to um, plug into the system, whether that's through direct funding, whether that's through partnership, whether it's through you know, leveraging other opportunities. Um, so this gives you sort of a general overflow uh, or I shouldn't say overflow, a general flow of the system. Um, and of course, this is largely, the public workforce system is largely, although not entirely, and I'll talk about some opportunities that are, are separate from that, but it's largely driven by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar with that, or WIOA as we call it. It's the primary workforce development legislation in the U.S., and it actually has a specific section, Section 166, that is um, about supporting Indian and Native American programming and the work of the division, <clears throat> excuse me, the division of Indian and Native American programs where my colleagues are from that I just mentioned. Um, so as it works anywhere, I suppose, Congress appropriates the funds to the US Department of Labor. And then we have the responsibility of providing these funds to the public workforce system, mostly through a formula that's defined in the legislation. Each year we, um, we be in the Employment and Training Administration allocate this funding to the workforce agencies of each state. And then the workforce agencies receive these funds on behalf of the governor and the state workforce boards. And the workforce boards uh, then carry out the day-to-day -day leadership and oversight of, of uh, local workforce development boards that sit under them. There are one or two states where they actually only have one workforce board because they're so small. Um, I believe Rhode Island is one of those examples, which probably makes sense. Um, but in general, they have local areas um, and, you know, and they focus very much on the local and regional economies of those areas. Um, but anyway, the state agency allocates the funding received by ETA to the local workforce development boards. And those boards develop the strategic vision for their local areas um, and set local training priorities, for instance. 
Um, they also may establish sector-based or other employer-focused um, initiatives and, and sector strategy partnerships is a huge part of what we're really focused on right now and have been for a while. It's a wonderful evidence-based model of, of, you know, of developing a, a sector ecosystem. Um, so I'll talk about this a little later um, in terms of, you know, some of the partnerships. But um, and then the final piece of that is really the local workforce development boards that then fund and manage American job centers um, and other partner programs. And so that's really, we used to refer to this as the one-stop centers. Um, and with WIOA, we sort of tried to rebrand it as American job centers. Every state may call them something different though with their own branding, but really those are sort of like the, the access point for those services that are developed. Um, so that's where you would go to get, you know, everything from specific job training or assessments, but also access to supportive services such as transportation, childcare, um, and, um, you know, referrals for other services. Um, so as I mentioned a little bit, just speaking specifically to WIOA section 166, um, the purpose of this program is to develop the academic occupational literacy skills for Native Americans um, and to make them competitive in the workforce by providing them the, you know, uh, the training and entrepreneurship skills necessary um, and provide and promoting the economic and social development of these communities. Um, in fiscal year 24, which we just got the appropriation for last month, uh, there was an appropriation of 60 million. Um, that supports the ability of these funds for tribes and Native American organizations. Um, so in terms of ways to partner, I've, you know, touched on these a little bit, but again, you know, partnership is probably the most important key word in the public workforce system. Um, there are many ways that you can partner with the workforce system, um, particularly as we work to develop the necessary skilled pipeline of, the, of workers for advanced manufacturing. Um, some of the key ways in which you can um, partner with the system is to um, leverage public workforce system, uh, you know, the ecosystem itself to help build your for workforce through partnership with American job centers, referral networks, um, you know, support for uh, funding for some of those supportive services that we've mentioned. Um, and any of the partner programming is another access point. I'll talk a little bit more later on about some of some of those programs, there are um, programs that are required partners of the American Job Centers, such as our Youth Build program, um, our Job Corps centers. There are a lot of these partners that are supported by WIOA and may have entry points or referral through the American Job Center networks. Um, you can develop or expand an existing registered apprenticeship programs. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. That's a huge area of focus, particularly with advanced manufacturing. Um, and then you can also apply for some of these competitive grants um, that I'll talk about a little bit to support your specific capacity building and training needs. So um, this is a, sort of a, a crazy little uh, a graphic, um, but also sort of fun. But really what we're talking about here is just the fact that the local workforce development board is really sort of the hub connection point because they're going to have information and access to all the other resources that you're going to need. If you're going to develop a, um, you know, a, a sector strategy partnership, a workforce board is going to be a key part of that. You're going to want to leverage both their connectivity to employers um, and industry, but also training funds and those supportive services and other resources that are, you know, education networks, everything that will be necessary um, to really do a good job of manifesting that sector strategy. So um, we just sort of like to highlight that as the hub for local communities. Um, they're well-networked, as I mentioned. Um, and we do have, um, you know, if you go to uh, our, um, uh, I can't think of what the link is called now, but it's it's a hyperlink on this. And I can share these slides afterwards if that's helpful. Um, but it'll show you how to find your local American uh, job center or local workforce board so that you know where they are near you. Um, some of you, I hope, are already connected to them. Um, so I may be, you know, preaching to the choir here, but if not, um, I just want to emphasize how important they are. And these yellow stars kind of highlight some of those, those access and alignment points um, that may be of interest. Um, so speaking about registered apprenticeship, as I mentioned, uh, we the administration has invested more than $440 million to expand and diversify apprenticeship. Um, by expanding, we mean into 
some of the less traditional apprenticeship industries. Everybody often thinks of registered apprenticeship as the trades, um, but we've had really concerted efforts to evolve registered apprenticeship beyond the trades. Um, and that includes everything from, for instance, cybersecurity, um, advanced manufacturing is a, is a really strong one. Um, we even just launched recently a teacher apprenticeship program. Um, we're developing them in healthcare, um, information technology, just really, really broadly trying to lean into this, again, evidence-based model. What we call the earn and learn model is a truly evidence-based model of how to effectively um, support your workforce while you're training them. Um, while giving them hands-on, you know, job training, which is another really important aspect of, of learning. Um, and so, you know, some of the information around this is that individuals that complete a registered apprenticeship program have an $80,000 starting salary on average. Um, and that's, you know, on average across all various uh, types of, you know, rural, urban, et cetera. Um, it's a really good quality job with a strong starting wage, great benefits generally. And on average, employers see a 90% retention rate um, with apprentices. So it really builds in a lot of the like hoped for quality workforce, you know, that that we want to see out there. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll point out is that um, in about probably about the last decade, maybe the last eight years, um, the, the Office of Apprenticeship in Employment and Training Administration used to just be focused on sort of helping to develop the standards, being a partner to industries or apprenticeship intermediaries um, who were developing the programs. It's only really in this last eight to 10 years that um, the Office of Apprenticeship started developing their own grant opportunities to really help seed that field and grow um, apprenticeship into some of these, you know, less, less resource sectors. Um, so that's been really exciting. And they've funded both a variety of contracts to support technical assistance to grow um, registered apprenticeships, such as some of these intermediaries, um, as well as direct grants to entities to help them develop their own registered apprenticeship uh, model or connect and grow registered apprenticeship into communities where it may not otherwise exist. So that's been really wonderful for us. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of great success there. Um, so just to highlight how we generally talk about eligible lead applicants when we're talking about, um, you know, tribal or Indian um, Native American entities, um, you'll often, you see this language, either a workforce development entity, um, and that's any of our public workforce entity, entities, such as the local workforce development board that I described, but it also means any of the Indian and Native American program entities that are eligible for funding under that WIOA section 166. Um, also, we speak about Native American tribal governments, and um, there's a citation there for, you know, who qualifies for that. And then speaking specifically to, of course, this audience in terms of tribal colleges, um, in terms of identifying who meets that criteria, um, the Department of Labor has generally worked with the Department of Education to utilize their college navigator and the way that it identifies specialized missions of, um, of the entities in the college navigator. So, I mean, we use this as well for things like, um, you know, historically black colleges and universities, minority serving institutions, et cetera. Um, so those may be terminologies that you'll see when we're referring to who are eligible um, applicants for our grants. Um, I also wanted to really point this out. I don't know if you all are familiar with this. This is a relatively recent action, um, but just in December of last year, there was an executive order, executive order 14112, um, called Reforming Federal Funding and Support for Tribal Nations to Better embrace, embrace Our Trust Responsibilities and Promote the Next Era of Tribal Self-Determination. Very much a mouthful of a title for an executive order, um, but I wanted to just call out some of the highlights here. And I'll say that related to this is these highlights um, were used to just, uh, I believe it was late last month, if not earlier this month, um, update our what we call uniform guidance. And the uniform guidance is from the Office of Management and Budget. And it's, you know, it's it's the overarching guidance about what are allowable costs, how our funding opportunities should work. It has sort of these overarching principles and requirements. And you may be familiar with that, but this, this guidance was updated um, to support some of the efforts in this um, executive order. And that means really specifically calling out some of the things we can do to do a better job of helping um, tribal entities to be eligible for and attain our grants. We've really been generally focused on trying to be um, more diverse 
in who gets our grant opportunities, meaning, you know, not always the same entities who once they figured out how to do it well, just keep getting our funds, but really trying to find ways to broaden the reach, whether it's um, requiring that, you know, a certain amount of funding only goes to people who are entities that haven't gotten our grants before, which is something that Youth Build Program does, or, um, you know, or creating other sort of specific call outs of funds to support um, that diversification and to create more support specifically for some of the the unique um, barriers that we know that um, tribal entities have dealt with when it comes to applying for our grants. So highlighting some of those things here um, that, you know, that we're focused on implementing right now with our grant programs is identifying some of the funding programs that may specifically allow for a tribal set aside within the funds um, to really try and, and lift that up. Um, designing our application reporting criteria to be less burdensome. This is certainly something we've heard in a lot of places about how cumbersome our funding opportunities can be. Um, some of that is as simple as just making sure we're writing it in plain English, making sure that we're reducing how long and repetitive they can sometimes be, um, and just, just trying to streamline the criteria and the processes for applications. Um, additionally, increasing the flexibility of federal funding for tribal nations, um, you know, making sure that there aren't unnecessary limitations on how the funds can be spent um, so that they can have more flexibility for training, administrative costs, and personnel. And then um, I'll also point out this one, um, improving accessibility by, you know, identifying where there are matching and cost sharing requirements um, that have uh, been problematic for specific um, populations that we want to get our grants, either by, you know, um, allowing for more flexibility in what can qualify as those match or cost sharing funds or creating a, um, a waiver of those funds. Um, so those are all things that we're starting to implement now. I hope that if you've been looking at some of our recent grants, you may have seen some of that, um, but it is still underway and there's still development happening. Um, so I just wanted to call out some of the like overarching investments that may be of interest. Some of these more so than others. Um, on this particular slide, I did want to highlight our building pathways to infrastructure jobs. Um, we've funded actually, oh, it says 93 million here, but I realize it's actually really 94 million that we funded in our first round. In that first round, we did also cite that we would, if we had funds available, um, try and do a second round of competition. And we're exploring that right now, trying to get a sense of what funding will be available. So I want to put that on everyone's radar because certainly, um, you know, infrastructure includes a large focus on advanced manufacturing. You know, I mentioned semiconductors before, a lot around the green jobs, um, electric vehicle manufacturing, um, you know, solar technologies. There's a lot really relevant to advanced manufacturing here. And also it's just um, really meant to focus on connecting the necessary workforce training to the, you know, two trillion in investments that I mentioned, particularly with the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, that has um, also, I, I want to point this out and I'll put this in the link when I'm done with my presentation. I saw that Kavehi um, from Department of Labor had asked about, you know, specific investments, particularly in some of these rural communities. Um, and I don't know how aware you all are, but there is a tribal playbook that was put out by the White House that identifies a large number of infrastructure funds that are targeted specifically for investment in, um, you know, rural and under served um, tribal communities and reservations. And those are things to support like, you know, the broadband to support uh, water quality, infrastructure for transportation. Um, so there's a lot of connectivity both with the needs and resources of those communities and what these grant funds can support. Um, and um, one example I wanted to point out from round one is that we did have a um, United Indians of All Tribes Foundation based in Seattle, Washington has a native workforce services program that got a $2 million building pathways grant. Um, and they're really focused on transit and electrified infrastructure projects. Um, but we have we have abstracts and information on each of our awardees. So it might be helpful for um, you know, for for those interested to kind of look at how some of these projects work. Like I said, they all require sector strategies. And what that means is sometimes while the tribal college may not be either the eligible or even the logical um, lead entity they could be a great partner on a lot of these projects, right? And I think it's really important to note that, to, to kind of look at the grant opportunities with a, you know, a lens toward how might we not necessarily apply, but like reach out to some partners who would be the ones to apply and develop that sector strategy to support and benefit all of us. 
Um, so I think that's something really important to, to keep in mind as you look at these opportunities. Um, you'll see the, um, you know, one of the grants that I spoke about earlier with Office of Apprenticeship, Apprenticeship Building America. This is their second round. It just closed, but they did a second round. They might do a third round. And in general, a lot of their grants, um, if not all of them, you know, uh, often eligible applicants include um, tribal colleges and universities amongst other um, institutions of higher education. So, um, you know, IHEs have a great uh, uh, history of, of supporting and developing registered apprenticeship models. Um, so we're all for that. Um, I quickly wanted to point out work here, the Workforce Opportunity for Rural Communities Grant. Eligible, this is still open and um, eligible entities for these grants are Native American tribal governments, um, Indian housing authorities, Native American tribal organizations other than federally recognized tribal governments and tribal con tribally controlled colleges and universities as well. The interesting thing about this one is that it is geographically specific um, to support uh, and fund projects, sorry, to fund projects supporting rural communities that have been hard hit by economic transition um, and recovery. So those are specifically Appalachian region, the lower Mississippi Delta, and the northern border region. But where those overlap uh, with any of the, you know, uh, um, any of the listeners on this webinar, um, please think about that one because it is still open, as I mentioned. And then I just really wanted to quickly call out Youth Build on this um, slide as well. Youth Build, um, eligible lead applicants for Youth Build include any Indian and Native American entity eligible for grants under Section 166. As I mentioned, um, and that includes federally and other than federally recognized tribes, Native American nonprofit organizations. Um, and then um, this, this, and this is one of the great examples that I mentioned that has done this for a few rounds already, where they, this uh, program generally requires a 25% match of funding, but in the most recent rounds has allowed um, that tribal entities, as well as some other small U.S. insular areas do not have to provide that match commitment. They have a waiver because we we had some conversations with various um, tribal um, leaders and they shared with us how difficult that can be. So, uh, you know, I hope that that's being impactful as intended. Um, really quickly on this slide, I just wanted to call out uh, our senior community service employment program. This is a pretty unique program in that it really focuses on older low income individuals and provides them supportive, supported um, subsidized employment training opportunities. But for the first time ever, this funding opportunity, which is also still open, has a specific set aside for Indian Native American um, grantees. So any um, public or nonprofit national Indian aging organizations can provide these services. And, um, you know, and this again includes all of our usual um, eligible entities. Not sure if that one's as relevant for tribal colleges, but um, also just kind of highlighting the ways in which we're focusing our efforts. Um, then on this one, I just wanna call out, and this one I think rings a lot of bells um, based on what I've heard so far in um, the presentation today, which is our Strengthening Community Colleges grants. Um, I wanna point out that these are actually managed out of my office, as was the Building Pathways um, grants. But the, the point of these grants is um, the lead entities have to be community colleges. And that includes, um, you know, they have to be public, but so that includes public two-year tribal colleges and universities, again, as, as designated by the um, College Navigator from the Department of Education. Um, but it also allows for, um, the, the lead applicant has to be a community college, but it, but it also allows for individual awards and consortium awards. And in those consortia, the lead applicant, again, has to be a community college, but it can also include other members who are either other community colleges or even four-year institutions. Um, we have a lot of community college grants uh, that have focused on advanced manufacturing, and I'll highlight a few of those examples in the next slide. But the other thing I'll point out is these are really capacity building grants. And I know that John spoke a lot about um, the need to build capacity for staff internally, those are things that can very much be used with these funds. The intent of these is to make the community colleges stronger workforce partners by either helping them with their, you know, um, more rapidly, acceler you know, accelerated uh, credentialing opportunities, developing um, or buying equipment that they need. Uh, it, a lot, the first round of these awards actually started during COVID. So a lot of that first round was really focused on, you know, hybrid um, 
you know, hybrid learning opportunities. Um, and some of that, you know, still remains like, how do you just, how do you touch more people um, having more flexibility in your programs, but, but staff equipment, even some minor classroom renovations are all things that are L um, allowable funding mm. with the strength of community college grants. Um, I'll also point out that um, we just awarded, we just announced our fourth round, but we already have appropriations for the fifth round. So that will be happening soon. And um, our second, starting with our second round and going forward, we've really focused on uh, equity gaps and requiring that grantees identify specific equity gaps that affect certain populations that are underserved or marginalized and focus on trying to address those. Um, and so we have a lot of them that are focusing on specific like, you know, minority retention rates or minority um, persistence and completion rates. And certainly those are all things that I think would be relevant for, um, for this audience. So I encourage you to think about those programs. Um, again, I know I'm probably, oh, well over time. Oh gosh, okay. Um, so I won't go into too much detail with this, but these are um, a few examples of um, some of the community college uh, advanced manufacturing models that we've seen. And we do have abstracts and more information available online. Happy to share all of that with you afterwards. Um, in terms of some other resources that you might find, and I have only one more slide after this, so I'm almost done. Um, I'll just highlight that uh, we do have also uh, a competency model clearinghouse that the Department of Labor manages. Um, and the website is here, our careeronestop.org competency model. And we have um, probably the most fleshed out competency models for advanced manufacturing. And just as a couple of examples here, we have the general advanced manufacturing competency model, as well as a specific semiconductor nanotechnology competency model. Um, we have a few more advanced manufacturing competency models that are on the website. And these are just, you know, helpful tools as you try and consider, you know, curriculum development and what's what's needed in the field. Um, and then finally, one other resource I wanted to point out that is completely free. Um, this was started through our precursor to Strengthening Community Colleges, which was our uh, trade adjustment assistance community college and career training grants um, which is called skills commons and skills commons is a gargantuan repository of free and open um, resources everything from uh, curricula to uh, you know um, um, materials on how to recruit um, all of these are and these are just some examples of some of the advanced manufacturing uh, resources that are available, but it's well worth taking a look at um, Skills Commons and getting a sense because the goal of this was for people not to have to recreate the wheel with new curriculum, um, but instead create an open educational repository for people to be able to look. Um, and we've had more than a million downloads on Skills Commons. It's, it continues to be very popular and active. So I would definitely encourage people to, um, to look at that uh, resource as well. I will stop there, but I am going to put in the, the chat the um, link to the tribal playbook for infrastructure, as I mentioned, and please feel free to put in the chat if there's anything else I've mentioned um, that you would like me to share. Um, thank you for letting me talk so long, and apologies. <laughs> no problem, Jen. Thank you so much. Patrick, can you, uh, uh, are you on? No, okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, th this is great. Thank you so much, Jen, uh, for stepping in and sharing so many great resources. I think we, we forget about all the resources that are layered throughout all of our regions. And there's so many specifics for tribal communities that are out there right now, especially through the specific executive orders and all the agencies coordinating uh, to, to really perform some things for our, our tribal friends. So I think we need to take advantage of it. This is the time to take advantage of those, those resources. Thank you all for your participation today. I wish we had more time for conversation and questions. I know everyone on this is an expert on themselves uh, and would love to have a, a great, greater conversation. We'll revisit a lot of these things and uh, maybe uh, host another webinar in the near future. Just a to have a wrap up, if, if you will. But we will have some articles in the Tribal College Journal. Um, we're putting all of these webinars plus additional materials together in a video uh, uh, summary uh, that's gonna be a professionally uh, done video that we can use for a variety of different ways. And it'll be in different uh, lengths so that we can talk about advanced manufacturing in tribal colleges and tribal communities uh, in, in 
uh, an abbreviated way, abbreviated focused ways. And so we'll be putting a lot of the information all of us have, have gathered uh, in, in, in better ways in the near future. But beyond all of that, we want to encourage the, 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 the relationships and the networking that are potential through today uh, and through these webinars. So you will see some emails. Now that you're part of our team, now that you're part of these, these, these networks, uh, you'll be receiving some things from Patrick and myself about how to connect and uh, those kind of things. We will also use the Jamboard uh, that some of you have been uh, participating on. We'll include those in a lot of the things that we have. We're, we're not throwing any of this away. We're collecting all of this information and building. A, and, and again, this is building and building and building. So we have uh, a lot of resources and a lot of things for the potential for advanced manufacturing and tribal communities. Again, thank you all so much for your time and uh, contributions today. And uh, I look forward to talking with all of you in the near future. Thanks again for participating. Have a great day.